of January. Most of you have seen them, most of you have completed it. The people that haven't seen it yet, uh, we received an email two days ago about it. Please make sure you finish it up by 2 o'clock this afternoon, and it's about 1% of your course grade every single grade. So there'll be one every week, and this is what we spoke about last week. Anyone not clear what this is about? Okay, yes. Roughly every Wednesday, every Wednesday, you are flying. Okay, so please make sure you sign in and complete that. Okay, next, uh, let's continue on with uh, this section of the courses on modeling. And how many of you have got a cup of coffee in front of you today? Coffee? Yeah? Okay. What happens to this cup of coffee over time? The temperature. Cool, right? So you go wherever you buy it from, 55 degrees C typically, and it does not sort of change over time. Newton's law of cooling, right? We learned about that in heat transfer or in physics. Newton's law of cooling tells us that this temperature, T, over time has this sort of declining exponential shape. Guys, I need you to please be quiet. Okay? So temperature over time increasing. And we modeled that with a differential equation t by dt. And we said that, or in prior courses you may be familiar with the concept of that, decreases over time in proportional to the temperature difference. So let's make that clear. Let's perhaps add that onto our graph. There's time. And here's some sort of ambient temperature, Ta. And that temperature is going to cool in proportion to the temperature difference, T minus Ta. So if the temperature of the coffee, T, is equal to Ta, there's no temperature difference, the temperature dt by dt is not changing over time. So that, that makes intuitive sense to us. So there's temperature cooling over time, and let's say that's K equal to 0 0.1, and it has units of inverse time. What would that curve look like if the temp if K was a larger number? Would it decrease slower over time, faster over time, or have no effect? Okay. So if k is a higher number, it would have a steeper slope down. Because that now is more negative k. Okay, so there's my ODE. Solve it analytically. You've got a minute. <coughs> Initial condition t at time 0. Let's just call it t naught. Solve that analytically. We want an expression of T, temperature as a function of time, equals some expression. We know there's going to be an exponential in there. Know intuitively what the slope, or what this curve looks like over time. Your answer t as a function of time must have an exponential. Okay, so your aim is to say t of t is equal to.
you don't like drinking coffee, this is the same reason why you put beer in the fridge. It's going to decrease over time. Okay, so your analytical solution is you're going to integrate the temperature over time, so that's 1 over T minus TA. Our initial condition is integrated with T naught some final time T. T. That's the integral from time zero to time t equals zero to some final time t. We're integrating minus k t. So integrating that, you'll get the log of t minus t a divided by t naught minus t a minus kt. And then some rearrangement of that expression gets you a final answer that temperature over time is equal to ta, the ambient temperature, minus t0 minus ta, e to the minus kt. So there's my t naught. And as time goes up to infinity, this exponential term goes to zero and I'm left with t a. Okay. So at infinite time, I'll be at t a. So we get that exponential decline towards t a. So this is your beverage cooling in the room or when you put your beer in the fridge. Why do you put your beer in the freezer if you want it to cool really quickly? Why do they get the larger difference between T minus TA? Okay, so same idea here, and you get that cooling profile over time occurring. So we solved that analytically over there. Today's class is all about using the Laplace transform to do this. And now the Laplace transform for this example is going to seem a little more complicated. It's very easy to solve that. But let's use the simple example to understand what the Laplace transform is. some theory because it's been a while since we've come to the transforms. So the mass transform is defined as f of s, capital F of s, for a function f of t. So what we'll say is, we'll use this notation, f of s is equal to the Laplace transform of it. And so in that page that you have in front of you, that handout, please add that to your diagram. So if you go look at that Laplace transform diagram, right at the top, on the top right hand side, where it says f of s over there, right there equals the Laplace transform of f of t. So what you see in the right hand column is already the Laplace transform of the function lowercase f that's in the left hand side. So emphasize that to yourself that f of s is equal to the Laplace transform of lower f of t. Okay, and if you go back to your math notes, f of s, that's just a function. Okay? talk about that in a minute, as defined as the integral from 0 to infinity 
of that lowercase f of t multiplied by this term e to the minus st. And so the Planck transforms are defined as the multiplication of the function f with this exponential e to the minus st, and you end up with that with respect to dt. So Laplace transfers are really nothing too special, They're simply just one of many type of integral transforms. Okay, so this is an integral transform, and that e to the minus st is what's called in math terminology the kernel. You multiply your function f by a kernel, integrate it between some limits, 0 to infinity, and you get back another function f, simply just let's write here another function. So you converted your function f of t to a new function f of s. That f of s is some desirable property. So it's not, there's not nothing special going on here in the mechanism. Simply converting a function from one form to the other. The Fourier transform is another one of these types of integral transforms. Now, it's sometimes for many people unsatisfying just using a formula. I'm one of those. I don't like to just use this because I understand where this comes from. Okay, and it's something that you should normally cover in your second year math course, and most universities don't cover why this is defined like this. But there's a great MIT video on YouTube where the professor explains exactly what's going on here, and I posted that to the website. So there's no need for me to derive his derivation. Please go watch that. Uh, it's a really insightful derivation of where the, the past comes from. So for our purposes here, we're using it as a way to solve ODEs, and we're going to put in our function lowercase f of t, and we're going to get a function capital F of s. So let's talk a little bit about what that Laplace transform is doing and see <coughs> some examples. Let's take the most trivial example where our function f is actually just a constant. So our function f really doesn't actually depend on time. It's simply a constant. So in other words, what is the Laplace transform of f of t equal to some constant c? This one isn't actually in the table, so let's derive it here. The Laplace transform of any constant, well, let's sub in and actually try to use that Laplace transform over there. It says if we wanted that, we'll call that f of s, and that's going to be equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of our function f, which is just a constant c, multiplied by e to the minus st. If we integrate that between 0 and infinity, we get minus c e to the minus st over s out there. And we're going to integrate that between the limits from 0 to infinity. What we'll find then is that f of s is simply c over s. Transform of constant is that constant value is simply divided by s. By just using that, that rule of the definition. Let's take another one, the set function. So this function now actually is varying with time. So our second example. Step function. We'll call that s of t. And what the step function is, or looks like, rather, is to say, well, it's zero when time is less than zero, and it's equal to some constant for time greater than or equal to zero. So let's draw that s of t. It's time. S of t is 0 initially, and it steps up to some constant value c, and then continues on. Now, 
Now, this one is actually really easy to find with a class transform. We've already done it. We've actually done it over there on the right-hand side of the board. And the reason is, the class transforms, let's make this note, are only defined for times t greater than and equal to zero. So in this particular function, the step function, we don't really care what's happened to time prior to zero. We're only caring what happens at time zero and onwards. And so, in fact, then the solution to this Laplace transform for S of T is equal to what would be the solution over at? C over S. So it's the same solution, C over S. Are we having a new step function that's actually really hard to be at time equals to time zero? Yeah, we'll consider our step to occur at time zero. Next week we're going to look at what happens if our step occurs at other times. Okay, so if you take a unit step, that constant c now is simply equal to 1, then you get line 2 here in this on your page in front of you. So the unit step is a step of 1, so therefore that integral f of s for the fast transform is 1 over s, but in general it will be c over s. So you might want to modify line 2 there to indicate that if it's an arbitrary step of size c, we'll have a Laplace transform of f of s equal to c of s. Let's do one, uh, two more before we get to use it and try to solve our coffee cup system. <coughs> This one's going to be a little strange, but it's important to understand this one because we're dealing with ODEs here. For a step of size C. We're still at unit impulse. We'll talk about that later. So let's take a look at a third one, derivatives. So in other words, I'm saying, this might seem a little weird, but let f of t, the function we're trying to find the Laplace transform, be the derivative of it, f of t. So in other words, we're trying to find the Laplace transform of f of t, which is the same as the Laplace transform for the f of t. And that's going to be, if we sub into the definition, the integral from 0 to infinity of the f of dt times the exponential e to the minus st dt. Now let's use a dirty word, integration by parts. Okay, so integration by parts will be the solution to solving that. So remember u, v, dash, v, kind of messy, right? It's been a while since you've used it. So I'd like you to go and try that at home. It's not hard. Here's your one term that you're going to use in your integration by parts. There's your other term that you're going to use in your integration by parts. If you can do this, then you're really understanding what's going on. And what you'll find is the solution to that is equal to s times f of s minus f and time zero. So the Laplace transform of a derivative df of dt is equal to s multiplied by f of s, the Laplace transform of the function f, minus f defined at time zero. In other words, this is nothing more than saying the initial condition. So if you go down all the way to the bottom over there, line 24 shows you that, that term. So df of dt is my function, and the Laplace transform that is s times f of s minus f at 0. In other words, your function at 
It's an initial condition. And then one final one just to get, get you um, warmed up with this. And probably the one that you're going to see over and over the most is the one that's in line five. is exponentials. So by that I mean when f of t is equal to e to the minus bt. So let's put a constant in front of that exponential, e to the minus bt. We see this over and over, right? For example, the Arrhenius equation, energy temperature dependence, um, exponentials that change over time. Many of our first order systems have exponentials in them. So if you do the Laplace transform for this guy, so the Laplace to e to the minus bt, that's the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus bt multiplied by e to the minus st bt. And the solution for that, you can again try summing the limits. You'll get 1 over s plus b. This one we're going to see many, many times in the course. That's in line five. So our general approach is going to be the following. To solve systems of equations, ODEs, it's actually really easy for us to derive from a mass balance or an energy balance. We can easily derive dH by dt equals, or d concentration over time equals, or d temperature over time equals. We're really comfortable doing uh, deriving those differential equations, but solving them is a piece sometimes. So the approach we're going to follow with Laplace transforms is really quite simple. Let's just put a note here. This is the general principle. And we'll go ahead and use it. So the general principle is take your ODE. For example, it might be dt by dt. Take the Laplace transform of it. So just make note of that. That's saying we're going to take the Laplace transform of t versus t. And what we're going to get is some new function t of s. So the Laplace transform takes a time domain function. And that time domain function can be dt by dt equals all sorts of terms. We're going to take the Laplace transform of the left and the right hand side of that ODE. We're going to get a new function now in terms of s's, so t of s. Then we're going to simplify. This is going to be a small simplified step over there. So that will still leave you with t of s. And then our final step is to take the inverse transform. Okay. We're going to talk about that a little bit in a minute. We're going to call that L to the minus 1, the inverse Laplace transform. And the inverse Laplace transform takes T of X. Okay. We're going to give it the function that you see on the right-hand side column on that page in front of you. And we're going to go and move over to the left. Okay, what we're going to get from all of that is actually what our goal is at the end. We're going to get our time domain solution. So in other words, that's going to get me t as a function of time. So I'm going to start with dt by dt up here. And getting to t as a function of time can be really tough analytically in many cases. <coughs> the Laplace transform is going to be a tool to help us get t as a function of time in a simple way. And not only that, the reason why we go through this process is along the way we're going to learn about what our process is doing. And how we can predict actually what our process can do without even simulating it. 
So the large transform is a great tool to actually help us understand what our process is. Okay, back to your coffee. Or your beer. <laughs> Transform. You might want to add it to this general principle diagram of both sides. So take the Laplace transform for both sides. In other words, our goal is to solve the Laplace transform of dt by dt, and that's equal to the Laplace transform of minus kt plus kta. transform on the left hand side, the fast transform on the right hand side. Now I'm going to show you an interesting property of the Laplace transform is it's what we call a linear operator. In other words, a linear operator, let's just make a note here, a linear operator has a property that the Laplace transform of A times the general function x of t plus B times another function y of t. So the linear operator implies that that Laplace transform is equal to the Laplace, take our A constant, multiplied by the Laplace transform of x of t, plus take our B as a constant, multiplied by the Laplace transform of y of t. So linearity of an operator implies we can split out that operation onto the constituent of parts. So the part transform of ax plus by is equal to a times the Laplace transform of x plus b times the Laplace transform of y. Sometimes we'll use this, for example, if we were integrating height over time, the h by dt, we'll call that capital H of s. So it's this dependent variable that we take the Laplace transform. So that will be our convention in this course. 
So S times T of S minus the initial condition, and that initial condition happens to be T naught. I'll just emphasize that here. That's my initial condition. Okay, let's look at the right-hand side. The right-hand side, we've broken it out into parts. So what's the Laplace transform then of minus KT plus KTA? <coughs> That's the Laplace transform of K minus K, take that out, times the Laplace transform of T plus K times the Laplace transform of TA. Okay, yeah, we'll get to the solution in a minute. What I've written up here is right, that was wrong. TA is also a constant, okay? This term K times TA is a constant term as well. So in fact, it's the Laplace transform of KTA. Okay. Well, because that's constant, let me take K and TA out. Okay. So I'm just going to take that out here. But that's the Laplace transform of 1. Okay. I would just want to emphasize that. Did everyone see what I did? Yeah? So that's the Laplace transform of 1. So let's try to solve this. The minus k times the Laplace transform of t. Well, the Laplace transform of t is equal to t of s. Okay, let me emphasize that for you. A few of you are looking at this confused. Let's emphasize that that's the time dependence of temperature. So T is a function of time. The Laplace transform of T, my function, over time is simply that up there. Look at what you wrote on your page right at the top on the left hand, on the right hand side. You wrote F of S is equal to the Laplace transform of lowercase f as a function of time. This is doing exactly the same thing. The Laplace from transform of T as a function of time, simply the new shorthand we'll use is T of S. Okay, so, so that's why we can write that over there. Okay, plus K times TA, and what's the Laplace transform of a constant number one? Over S. So this is my right-hand side. Everyone comfortable with the right-hand side? Yeah? Okay. So let's equate the left-hand side and the right-hand side and move to our next step. We call, in that general procedure we said, take the Laplace transform, the next step is to simplify. So let's do that, simplify. So set the left-hand side equal to the right-hand side and solve for capital T of S. So take a minute to do that. Okay, so I'll give you a minute.
the number number three be true? Like where we just have t and then c is equal to one over s squared. Yeah, so if you're taking the Laplace transform and you'll see this coming up in the next time if you're dealing with say concentrations. You've just got that term standing there by itself. Yeah. Or, 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 sorry, not concentrate, if you've just got like um, an input into your process that's a ramp, then that would be the Laplace transform. But we're gonna see that in examples. It's just the way it's defined, right? If you go plug this into the Laplace transformation, We'll get to that in the next class. Yeah. So every entry in the table, we'll just use them without showing them in some examples first. Okay, so if anyone simplified the left-hand side, right-hand side, equal to T of S, what do you get? A bit of a mess, right? Okay, so our rule is to bring this T of S over to the left-hand side. So what we're going to get is S, T of S plus K T of S. Okay, we're going to keep our constants on the right hand side, so bring that T naught over. That's T naught plus K T A over S. Okay, so then let's pull this T of S out. That thing is T of S, S plus K. Okay. This is important, right? Our T of S term stands alone, and we're going to then divide through next by that, so we get T of S isolated on the left hand side. So what you should end up with is this T of S is equal to T naught over S plus K plus k times t a in the numerator, and in the denominator you have s times s plus k. So there's my Laplace transform. Now let's take the inverse. Okay. Now the inverse, let's just make a note here. You might want to make this in a different color or put it in a box separately to indicate it's not part of this example. But the inverse Laplace transform of any function f of s is equal to f of t only for times greater than so when we do that inverse step, it's only going to tell us what the function t of time looks like. Remember our goal is to find t as function of time equals. It's only going to tell us what that looks like at times 0 and onwards. And then the other thing we need to realize is that the transform and its inverse are unique. That's a mathematical property. Okay, so I'd like you to take a minute and take the inverse Laplace transform of the left hand side and take the Laplace transform of the right hand side. Terms. So the inverse Laplace transform is the same way as the forward Laplace transform in that it's, it's a linear operator. So we can take the inverse of this first term and add to it the inverse of the second term. So that's a, there's linearity there on the inverse Laplace transform as well. What's the inverse Laplace transform of T of X? here on the board. So our right hand side is going to be t of t equals what's this term this inverse of last transform of right hand. Um, 
And then we're left with 1 over s plus k. Okay, and then line 5 tells us that if we have a system of the form 1 over s plus b, the inverse is e to the minus bt. So replacing b with k, we'll get t naught e to the minus kt. This is promising. We're trying to get what we expect, that exponential function. So that's the first term. Take a look at the second term. What's the inverse of Laplace transform of the second term? So in other words, we write the inverse of Laplace transform of KTA. S, S plus K. Which line are you using that table? or minus symbol, like right? not a multiplication. So look back to what we said earlier about linear operators. Notice there was a plus sign in there, plus B, not multiplication. So look at line 9, look at line 13 on the table in front of you. Construct of multiplying numerators and denominators to factor out a term and get it closer to what you see in the table. That's that simplified step I was referring to earlier. So not, we're going to try and simplify our class transform to get it into a form that we can find on the table. Of course. That's next week. Yeah. We're partial fraction expansion. When you, sometimes you cannot factor it out. Okay, so now we've got line 13 there for us. Let's try and use line 13. That will tell me that this inverse of Laplace transform is TA. Take out that constant TA. Then what have I left? 1 plus e to the minus kt. Okay. So if you're looking at line 13 and you don't see how I did that, 
go up to line 13. What I did is I said, tau equals 1 over k. So in line 13, I used tau is equal to 1 over k. You can see that over here in this denominator term. So let's head back over here to this side and finish up what we started off with. Let's add that new term there. We said plus TA 1 minus E to the minus KT. So are we done? Pretty much. Let's just emphasize that that equation over there on the right-hand board is the same one we started off with analytically. Can I erase this off here? I want to here on the right-hand side. Yeah. Okay, so just a final simplification step. T of T is equal to T naught e to the minus KT. So we can do that and C plus TA, 1 minus E to the minus KT. So simplify that out. Bring out that T naught over here. Collect the E to the minus KT terms. Oh, TA. There it is. Okay. So that's TA, sorry. Bring out my e to the minus kt term, so that's t naught minus ta e to the minus kt. That's where we started off with actually in the first 10 minutes of the class. <coughs> okay, so let's uh, do quick checks. Always to do this. Um, we did these checks, in fact, at the start of the class, but always when you do the real class transform, do two checks, really important checks. We're going to look at it next week. We're going to call it the initial value theorem and the final value theorem. And what they do is they can tell us what the initial and final values are going to be. So the initial value theorem is all about saying what is t when t time is zero? What's that in this case? Time lowercase t is zero. Yes. T naught, 65 degrees, okay? And t, when time is infinity, the final value is equal to ta. Okay, so put t, a really large number in there, that exponential disappears, and you have the ta. So we're going to look at next week how you can use, before you even come back to the time domain, when you're still in the Laplace transfer form, how you can find the initial and final value. Okay. That's going to be really interesting. We're also going to do the partial fashion expansion.